Hey everyone, welcome to the Capital City Bourbon Show. This is your host Luke, and I'm here with my co-hosts Alex and John. We're thrilled to be here with you all today, so grab yourself a glass of whiskey and come join us on the porch. Welcome back to the porch. We are certainly glad to be here with you all today. It's been a few weeks since Alex and John and I have been able to get together, but we are we are happy to be on the porch and very happy happy to share spirits together again. We uh, you know since it's been a little while, we thought we'd we'd come back with something big, something exciting, something that's uh, a little bit out of our wheelhouse. We're actually not going to be drinking whiskey today, believe it or not. We are uh, we are diving in to the world of Armagnac, uh, but not just any Armagnac. Uh, we're gonna be tasting perhaps one of the most rare and unique spirits available in the market today. Uh, this is a, a really a phenomenal spirit it's produced by a gentleman whose reputation, uh, not only in the whiskey business, but spirits in general uh, precedes him today. Uh, we could spend hours talking about his background and all the things he's done. Unfortunately, we don't have that much time. Uh, but we're going to discuss this new product with them and just hear all about it. It is uh, truly one of a kind, uh, and I'm just very excited to get into it. So, gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the one and only Raj Batka. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for those kind words, Luke. It is uh, great to be here with uh, with you and your uh, merry band of drinkers. <laughs> That's how we always consider ourselves. You know, we are, we're, we're, we're happy fellows and we just like drinking. So um. nothing wrong with that. Nothing. We need more happy fellows uh, in America today. I think, what do you think? Well, I absolutely <laughs> agree with that. You're well yeah. on your way to uh, developing a few. <laughs> yeah. Let's just say we, we started a little early today and I don't know. I feel like we got a lot more happy over the past <laughs> few minutes. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that's one of the big things that I um, that I took away from when I was putting the ideas of, you know, blending and what Bakta would be. Um, so Bakta 50, right, which is which is really in a certain way a misnomer. Um, you know, it really should be Bakta 150 because that's the oldest spirits in the in the blend or at least 150-50 because that's the range. It's from 150 to 50 years old. And, you know, we're talking about this uh, sort of uh, hysteria that's happening all over today. But when I go back to the vintages that are in this bottle uh, of Bakta 50, which are from 1868 to 1970, you got 1868, you know, civil war had just ended, right? Half the country is, you know, bombed out literally. Uh, the actually only true impeachment that ever happened. Uh, I think there was Andrew, uh, Andrew Johnson is impeached in the White House. Wow. Um, then you have 1897. Uh, 1939 is a vintage in there. I mean, you want to talk about a bad year? The war is breaking out. Uh, Hitler invades Poland. The whole of Europe is going away. And if you're in this little French village where... Uh, Armagnac is from the you're watching your sons, you know, march off to war, another war. And the last time, you know, war happened in Europe. I mean, it killed uh, killed five million men in World War uh, in World War One. So it wasn't like and then you have. But then you, here's my point. Forty six. The sun is shining. You know, uh, America came out of the Civil War, a superpower. The World War II ended, you know, with much less bloodletting than um, at least on the French and English and American side than, than could be imagined. By 46, you know, the sun is shining again and there's recovery. Uh, 1952, uh, America's booming. 63, there's an assassination. JFK dies. And here's my point. You know, there's a lot of ups and downs in history. And, uh, you know, what I like to think of what's contained in this bottle of Bakta 50 um, is an exquisite spirit, but it's also the history of, you know, mankind in the past uh, 150 years. And with an average age of 70 years old, um, you know, Bakta is pretty much the oldest spirits out there. 
Um, but as, and I'll be quiet here and, you know, talk about something uh, else, whatever you want to. But the rare thing here is normally you have a spirit that's on the average of 70 years old. It's not going to taste great. The, you know, bourbon probably starts heading downhill, at, you know, pick at 15, certainly by 20 years, it's gone down, getting too much wood. Scotch can, you know, last a little bit longer. Actually, you know, scotch will go a lot longer than that. The, but Armagnac, uh, which is from this sleepy region in France where, the, you know, this undiscovered gem I came across uh, is really the spirit in the world that stands up to really long-term aging better than any other, better than anything else on the planet. And you can taste the results. So what do you guys think of this? What do you pick up? I mean, this is, this is my first dive into, into Armagnacs. And I mean, the nose on this is, is fantastic. I mean, it, it really does weigh on you that, that we're drinking history here and not just the spirit. I mean, that's, that's a, that's just powerful, but I mean, you can get just the butteriness and the, the caramel. I mean, this is fantastic juice right here. Absolutely. And this is all, all from a grape, from the grapes, right? That's correct. That's John, right? Yes. No, no, we're not drinking grain at all. This is no, this and is all, all of these grape, right, man. It's, it does. It tastes, it tastes like, you know, it tastes like whiskey. It does. The, the, it, it absolutely does. Yeah. The, the interesting thing here, I'll talk about Armagnac for a second. So Armagnac is in the Southwest region of France. Yeah. We haven't really heard of it. Right. The, it's an accident of history, really an accident of history. So I, I sold Whistle Pig whiskey back in what, uh, 2019. But even before that, I began traveling uh, the world looking for really great uh, old spirits. I, I first started in whiskey. And so what built Whistle Pig, not to talk too much about my old brand, um, was great basically finding a fantastic old stash of rye. There was a guy named Dave Pickerel, uh, who you and some of your listeners may remember. He was the master distiller of Maker's Mark, very famous guy in the business. But we found this old stash of rye and we brought this old rye to market in a time when nobody else had old rye. That was 10 years old. I thought that that was old, right? And I'm over in France. I'm with my wife. There's this red book that comes with, um, you know, each of these bottles. And there's a the depiction here. My wife chasing me out of the house. There you go. John's got it. My wife chases me out of the house. I get into a car. to a bit of a hot rod Cadillac. And uh, I drive across France. And uh by the way, my wife throws me out of the house. I mean, I'll tell you, like I hadn't really done anything bad, really. She was, she, she was, she was pregnant. I mean, certainly not to my standards. The um, she was pregnant uh, with baby number four and was just in one of those uh, moods where she she wanted me out. Uh, I obliged and uh, I drove over to Armagnac. Uh, because I had had some, you know, I'd heard of this Armagnac thing. Uh, you may have heard of this. There was a Boss Hog line of Whistle Pig that I created, which was the high end line. In my opinion, the best ever Boss Hog was called the Black Prince. And I think that was the third or the fourth one. Um, anyway, we finished that in Armagnac casks. And I, I was sort of looking, we had bought all these different casks. We had this like Mizanara casks, which was you know, even before that was cool. We had port, we had every sort of you know, biggest, really big experimental cask finishing program. And this thing called Armagnac, I mean, it sounded mysterious to me. It, it, was, it was interesting. It was, what is this? I mean, it's a whole spirits category that I find out is the, by the way, the oldest spirits in the history of the world, right? Is, is Armagnac this a papal legate? You know, somebody gets sent out from the from the Roman Church, you know, in the mid thirteen uh, hundreds, and is sent into this area, and he starts writing back about Armagnac. I mean, this is the first recorded spirit, distilled spirit, in Europe, and he basically says he, he writes back to the Pope and says, "This stuff cures everything." You know, he even, he, he even implied, I don't know why the priest needed this, but he even implied that it like it cured um, erectile dysfunction. He says, you know, you, you rub this stuff on the member and, you know, you're off to, off to the races, boys. <laughs> <laughs> you just um, sold a ton of it. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, I'm Catholic. I don't want to, I don't want to screw with the church too much. I might get in trouble. 
The, but he writes back, and this is the first recorded spirit in history. Despite the fact that this is the oldest spirit in the world, really, it's never made it out of France for a number of different reasons. But that's not even the half of it. The thing that really blew me away is I go into this, uh, I go into this, this village called, um, I'm not kidding you, Condom, C-O-N-D-O-M, Condom, as they say it. I thought my... Uh, my aide de camp, as I call him, was kidding me when he told me where I was heading to type condom into the GPS. <laughs> um, and, uh, and he opens up his cellars, and I literally am looking at every vintage, basically, from the 2000s going back to 1868. And I'm coming from the whiskey world, and like you got something that's 10 years old and that's old. So I was like, how did this, how did this even survive, right? There have been three German invasions since the beginning of those, since like the oldest stuff is in here. You know what the first thing that, that soldiers do when they enter a town, you know, they basically, what do they look for? I mean, they look for two things primarily. First, they look for the booze, right? And then they get all drunk and then they misbehave very badly in general. The, um, so this made it through, you know, you have 1868, 1897, 1930, and that blows me away. What was the facility? It was uh, it was it was basically a, a chateau, like a castle. Um, it's it's sort of like a they call it a chateau. It's like a very grand townhouse that had these underground uh, caves where they kept the spirit. But during the wars, I found out that they would take it out to the countryside and hide it around the farm sides, which is what they did. Wow! And so this being a great, what's the the loss rate on there or is there none and that's why it's survived for 150 years it's much lower so here's what happens alex the so you lose there are a couple things which drive the speed of your aging process you have the type of wood right you have your let's say temperature and humidity conditions um and let's say that those and the size of the barrel, like those are just a few of the criteria, but let's just talk about those. So in Kentucky, in, in, in bourbon, let's say it goes into a new barrel, 50 gallon, 50 gallon barrel, right? New, charred. Okay, so the aging process is in this barrel, the new charred oak uh, in the climate of let's say where most of the barrels are in Kentucky in that part of the world, hot, cold, hot, cold, very hot, humid summers, the, you get a very fast aging process, right? And that's in a new barrel, new barrel, charred barrel. Okay. Now, so they even char this thing to make it age faster by year five. I mean, you're, you're good. I mean, you really, you don't need to age it much more. Maybe you'll get a little bit better by eight, maybe 10, maybe 12. I mean, but, but generally by five, you got a perfectly good product. The, now compare this to what they do in Armagnac. And, and I'll talk about the type of spirit for a second. In Armagnac, it goes into a barrel twice the size. The, it goes into French oak, which is a denser oak. I didn't mention that. The, the, so the amount of exchange you know, this, the smaller the barrel, you're faster, you're aging. So this goes into a big barrel, very dense barrel, and that's been used before. So there's like a, the tea bag effect, right? I mean, you, the first time you put a tea bag into, you know, a hot cup, it's going to discharge the most, you know, potency and flavor. And then every time you use it after that's a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less. But if you want to age something really long, you want it in a, you know, in an older barrel, you want it in a dense barrel. You want it in a climate controlled environment where it doesn't, you don't have these big temperature swings. And finally, and very critically, you want a spirit that's got a lot of oomph, you know, in the beginning, right? Because if you put something super sweet, super light and delicate, which may taste great off the still, right? you put that into a barrel for too long, it's gonna get, it's gonna get totally dominated uh, by the woods. So what you have in Armagnac is this really unique combination where the spirit, the, the barrels, the everything are designed for ultra long-term aging, which results in better quality, the a better taste profile, and, you know, put the quality the same. Let's say we have two things we can drink, right? And they taste, they taste the same. One's five years old, one's a hundred years old. 
which one is which one you want to taste. I mean, they, they taste the same. Right? Let's just say no, they won't taste the same because the hundred year old will be can't be the same as a five year old. But it's a much more interesting thing to drink. Right. So then, w- w- when you guys went over there and and picked these barrels of Armagnac out, a how'd you convince a Frenchman to sell it to you? <laughs> B and then so you, you did an eyelet finish. So did you rebarrel it or did you? How does that process work with you guys? So the Isla finish was completely, I got lucky. And it's funny, one thing about lucky, the it happens to people who are trying to get lucky, uh, much more so than people who are just sitting on their asses. Um, I, I don't mean to, to philosophize, but- uh, no, that's, that's good I've, philosophy. <laughs> that's one thing I've noticed. Um, so I, so I know, I gotta bring this to whiskey drinker. I'm a whiskey guy. The uh, I know it's the whiskey drinker who is basically being bent over a barrel by either, you know, really crazy uh, prices for thin age statements or I just want to talk about, you know, we all talk about craft in America. Here's another thing that blew me away. Guys, the the you go there and it's small little farmers distilling this stuff in wood burning stills in the countryside and they can only make for six times, six months out of the year max. And it's pretty much done for two or three months of the year. And I'm like, this is craft on a level that's, you know, storybook level from an American perspective, right? I mean, this is the way we were making whiskey 150 years ago here. So the, the but to answer your question about how did the Isla finish happen? So I'm thinking was well, like, okay, this is great. This Armagnac tastes great, but I need a bridge for myself, <laughs> myself in the beginning but also for other whiskey drinkers, how am I going to like get myself into the right? I mean, I've drank nothing but whiskey basically for 25 years. I can appreciate that this stuff tastes great, this Armagnac. I can appreciate the fact that really I should be drinking Armagnac because Christ, it costs five times as much to make new, right? Than whiskey. And then it's aged in a barrel that costs twice as much. And it's aged 10 times as long. Basically, it's a much more exquisite product but I'm not accustomed to drinking this stuff. So I'm going through the French countryside the, and I'm meeting different you know, producers as they're called farmers, basically. And I go to this one farmer, nice guy, you know, we're talking, he shows me his operation. We're tasting a couple of his Armagnacs. And I said, do you have anything like, you know, really unusual, really interesting? Uh, and he pulls out this, gla- this bottle that he had finished in a scotch cask particularly it was an old Buna Hopkins cast, he told me. And when I tasted it, I was like, this is it. This is Eureka. Because to me, it brought the best elements of classic iconic elements of whiskey. Uh, in this case, Isla whiskey, but the smoke uh, and the spice. Uh, and it combined that with the best elements, which was a creaminess and a sweetness and a butteriness that was in the Armagnac and they came together and it was to me, this is the best spirit in the world, bar none, you know, by far I'm biased. The, the, but uh, I've tasted everything at this point, but when you combine these two elements, I mean, look, but let me ask you this way. You guys have tasted anything. Does it taste like anything in particular like you've ever tasted? No. And you know, I, one thing I got to say, Raj, when I first got this bottle, I'll, I'll be 100% honest. I saw the Islay finish. I was a little put off. I've never been an Islay guy. It just, it doesn't suit my palate. Yeah. But I cracked this bottle and, you know, I just spent quite a bit of time nosing it. And it just blew me away how that finish worked so well. Just on the nose, you you know, I, I got that, those, those, you know, rich, buttery, fruity notes from the Armagnac. But that that smoke and that almost that minerality that came out from the Islay, it just blended so well, and it made yeah. it such a unique product. And, and you know, it really, it was, you know, I don't, I don't like to admit when I'm wrong, but I, you know, I was like, okay, I, I'm wrong because <laughs> it, that almost turned me away. But I said, you know what? No, this is so special. I gotta just, I gotta go with it. And I'm so glad I did because I, I was so impressed with that finish. I, I think. 
reading the book, it was just a, a two week finish. Is that right? Yes, quick, quick. Uh, well, here's the funny thing, Luke. I, I went through, I I can't, you sit me down and you put a glass of Lafroig in front of you or Ardbeg. It's too much for me. The I can't take it, frankly, I don't like it. Now, there was a time where I drank nothing but that, you know, the, that I was in love with it, that I was just crazy. I would drink Lagavulin and sick and Lagavulin and uh, Lagavulin and Lagavulin. Crazy for me. The, the, and then something changed and I, I, maybe I got like totally blotto on it one night and it was too much and it's all I could taste the next day. Maybe that happened. That's possible. Um, the, but at a certain point I didn't want to touch it anymore. But as you say, like, this is why I say it was luck. I would have never thought of it. If you told me that here's an idea, Raj, well, uh, the, 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 and Dave Pickerel came back from the dead, right? And he said, here's your idea, Raj. You're going to take all the oldest Armagnac in the world and you're going to throw it in the most heavily smoked dominating barrel. I said, you're crazy, Dave. <laughs> the, 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 I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. There's no way. It's crazy. I'm going to ruin this stuff. The, and plus, I don't even like Isla the, the anymore. But I tasted it. And when I tasted it, it was Eureka. The scales fell from my eyes. I owe that for, you know what? I'm going to take him out to like, I take him to a really nice dinner. I've got to figure out what he really likes because I owe that guy something. It was a really, really, you know, it just came together magically well. And then the, the way we mixed the vintages, you know, between 1868 and 1970 to complement it. Once you start drinking this, you don't want anything else. No, that's my one complaint against you right now is yeah, I'm looking at this bottle. I had no problem, you know, sitting here with John and Alex and drinking that thing and just and putting it away. But at the same time, I feel so guilty because I'm looking at that beautiful bottle. And I'm, I'm thinking of all the history we've, we've already talked about and the, the dedication that went into making this and preserving it. And I mean, it's history in a bottle and I, I would just feel so guilty drinking that much of it all at once. Cause I, it's so special. Yeah. You do feel like I do. I definitely know what you mean, right? You feel like, um, well, Look, if you don't drink it, the guy would the previous owner would have sold it to the Chinese. So <laughs> wow. the, the, I'm glad you you went when you did. And that's not the outcome. We have I to brought it to the American consumer. I'm uh, not a big fan of the Chinese or the chi kind Chinese leadership. I should put it that way. A big, big trouble. Uh, now. And <laughs> as an Asian American, right, Alex, I can say that. Absolutely. hundred percent. I see nothing wrong with it. <laughs> yeah. They, they just attacked India, too. Right. So how did you come to uh, to blend this and who, who, who helped you with the blending side of it? So there was, uh, here's another piece of, uh, I guess, good fortune, John. When I went there, there was a, the family that had the oldest stocks in the area. It was a, a Riest was the name, Riest du Peron. Um, they were, I don't know, five generations deep. And they wanted to get out. Um, and he had a he had a great team there. I mean, he had a great master blender. Master blender has been there since 1970. The previous master blender had been there since 1935, right? So you have a huge continuity. The guy before him had came in around the turn of the century. So there's a wonderful continuity. He really knew the blends. By the way, the master, the master blender, the cellar master, as they call uh, it, there. He, he didn't want to put it in the whiskey cask. I mean, he, he basically, um, you know, the, the French in that area, I think Alex, you asked me, how did I get the thing? You know, they're, they're um, well, the guy, I think basically was just intending just to, you know, yes, 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 me. And then I was going to go back to America and he was never going to do it because he wasn't going to take his precious Armagnac, right? And, and let this American, you know, uh, maniac ruin it by putting it in the most heavily peated, you know, Scott sounded crazy, right? So I forget how I got there. The I meandered a bit. So you asked me a question. I don't know if I answered it or not. How did you do the blending or who helped you with it? Oh, yeah. The, do, you the, the, uh, do you do the blending yourself or, you know? I, I was just blending last night. Um, we do it here and we do it in France. So the primary load goes to... Uh, this guy named Bernard, um, and Bernard does it in France, and he's been there for a long time and knows the, each of the vintages uh, very well. 
but we shipped about half the vintages over here. So half the inventory is sitting in Vermont. I'm on a college campus where you can like see my college president forebears uh, behind me. Yeah. Um, and I'll vote for your ancestors. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. 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 Not brown enough, John. <laughs> so my dad came from India in like 1968 and my mother's Irish. So I'm both, um, I am the first one in my family to be born in this, uh, in this great country. And it is a great country. Indeed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what, man, they, every so I poured this about 40 minutes ago to let it start opening up. And every time I go to, to nose it. It's just, I get a, like every nose is different. Sometimes I'm getting that smokiness. Sometimes I'm getting that peat. Sometimes I'm getting straight butter. And I mean, this is just a wonderful alignment of flavors that are so complimentary that I never would have thought would work. You know, like there's so many blenders that, you know, where they have a, a couple of complimentary flavors, some are conflicting, you know, provides for unique juices, but I mean, this is, you could put this in anything. I mean, this absolutely does drink like a whiskey and it's, it's insane. I mean, what, what, what did you use like a white grape? What kind of, what kind of grapes are used to make Armagnac? Yeah. So all, almost all, um, all distillate, right? So basically you get two primary groups of brandy that come from grape. You've got uh, cognac. Uh, and you've got Armagnac, uh, and all of it is white. Um, the, the dominant grape that's uh, used there is, uh, uh, they be used full blanche, they use this thing called columbard, they use uh, this grape called baco. Um, the, but uh, white grape, uh, and interestingly, by the way, I love like the idea that we're taking this stuff out of France and it's a discovery there and we're continuing to produce there. But I'm getting, you know, the whole the whole uh, operation uh, being, a, you know, on both sides of the Atlantic, we're getting going in Vermont. We've planted two years ago uh, a variety of different uh, winter uh, hardy bridles here. So uh, we're going to be producing actually right down the road from Whistlepig. Uh, um, the, uh, the grapes uh, in America as well, Alex. That's awesome. We're going to definitely have to come up there and check it out sometime. By all means, by all means. Hey, look, I've got this. Look at this college campus that I got. The the it's like largely empty, so I've got six hundred rooms. So you can bring you and six hundred of your closest friends. So <laughs> so this is not a one off. I mean, you didn't discover all of this in France. Uh, and to decide, decided to give it to us in a great presentation box, along with an education. But you, you're thinking you're going to run with, uh, with this for a while by growing your own grapes and beginning to reproduce this. You're going to miss all of the age. Where, where, where do you go from here? Uh, it's a great question, John. So this is batch one, right? The, the, this is a release, the year one, which was basically the end of last year in 2021. Um, is a release of 38 barrels, right? Each of those barrels is individual, is, is unique. So for you and your listeners, you got barrel five. My honest, sincere, that we started at $250 a bottle. Right now it's about $400 a bottle. I expect that it'll be definitely be $500 a bottle in not too long. And I think this is going to be, you know, this is going to go well up. My, where I'm getting to is this is an investment piece. This is going to be the original release of a long-term, what I think will be a brand um, at the very pinnacle of the spirits world. So this is one where you should, I, I, let me not, t my recommendation is to buy two of any one. If, if you've got, if you've got the dough, you should pick up, two barrels of each bottle that you can, but at least whatever you buy, buy two of, hold on to one, you know, as a stock and drink the other, the, because this is the inauguration of the brand and each barrel is different. So for example, you've got barrel five, barrel five, uh, the vintages, 
I, you know you've got 1868. I know it's got 1939. It's got some 46 in it. Um, but the vintages change in each one. So now we'll be releasing, we're in the teens of what's you know coming out to the to market. Each of the vintages are different. So some have 1897, some have 1888, some have 1939, some have 1924. All these are rare vintages. Some have 40, 46 is in most of them, but some have 42. The 52 could be 52 or 55, depending on how the seller master blended that one, 60. And then you've got a couple in the 60s. So each one of these actually is a fairly, we're, we're now beginning to blend barrel 16, which will come out later this summer. But each one of these things is a pretty painstaking process. Each barrel gets released out to market about 350 bottles by each barrel. The, um, so it'll be a long-term line. You'll see this, this, uh, this, this Bakta 50 line is gonna be called the Stockholder Series. And I'll uh, just drop this in there. If you, if you or a couple of your you know, listeners are interesting, we've got this collection where you can pick up two bottles of each barrel of the 38. You follow me? So, so you get, so you get, if you had the collection, because I go back and I look at my, you know what a boss hog one bottle costs right now? It's unbelievable. It's like a 15, 18, 12. I mean, something mid teens right now price. The, so, you know, I thought to myself and I, instead of like selling shares, which I did last time and it caused me headaches with partners and all this sort of stuff, the, which is in Whistlepig, the I'm selling collections very, very well priced of my inaugural releases. So you can buy a bottle of a, a, what I call the stockholder collection um, for if you pick it up from Vermont for $25,000. Now it started at 20, it's going up, it'll go higher than that, but you get 76 bottles and you put half of those away. I don't know whether it's, we're going to be worth five times as much or 10 times as much or 20, you know, but I expect something like that. And you can drink half of it, right? Because the whole collection is designed. You drink half your bottles over time. You gift them this and that. You stick half your bottles away. So literally you consume half of your investment and the half that you keep, you know, might, I can't make promises in these things, but I fully expect that if it's not 10, worth 10 times as much, I haven't done my job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so how do you, how do you go about acquiring that? Uh, you know, it's all mostly, it's all come from, um, you can send me an email, the send, send me an email or uh, they get it. Why don't they get in touch with you? They, they can get in touch with you and you can put them in touch with me. The, but it, I, it's, it's especially a fairly elaborate thing. I'm, I'm talking about it. I mean, basically you gotta, you gotta, I don't want to sound like a prick, but you, anybody, just anybody can't buy it. Right. Because if it, I don't want it to go into just collectors and they got a lot of demand on the thing. We're only doing 125. So if it, I don't want it, I want it to sit with somebody's hands who appreciates what they, they have, who's going to share it and not just stick it in a closet you know, like some, uh, what some Saudi prince would do with a beautiful woman in a burqa, you know, throw her in a burqa. And <laughs> her in a castle. No, there's no Scrooge McDucks here. That's my biggest issue, man. I'll buy things, you know, just, just like that. I'll buy, I had to start buying too. Cause it's like, God, I'm going to drink this. Yeah. You know, it's like, I'm going to get this bottle and wait six months and flip it and 30 days in, it's like, yeah, we're opening this thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know what you do? The, the right thing to do is just stick stick it over. You know, one day you'll have an investment that you want to make. You'll have some business deal that you want to do. Whatever. You need to get married, whatever the hell it is. It's the, mind boggling. Yeah. You 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 sell some you sell some of your you sell some of your collections. And that's what this is designed for. Because if you keep it around, yeah, you're right, you're gonna drink it. Yep. No, we've been doing pretty good. Um, that, and, and, you know, this is so I, I own a liquor store in Tallahassee called Market Square Liquors. Surprisingly, we're probably one of the largest retailers of, of Whistle Pig, uh, your old brand in the state of Florida, as, as well as the largest barrel par uh, purchaser for that for their program. What's the name of it? Market Square Liquors. OK, yeah, yeah. I remember that one. In Tallahassee. Cool. Yep. Cool. Yeah. And the, so John, Luke and myself, we're all on the barrel team and you know, at any given time, we've got like 30 to 40, 50 different barrel picks from any of the distillers out of Kentucky. 
you know, so, I mean, it's, it, it, we have such a deep appreciation for unique products that have been coming around, especially over the last couple of years with this emergence of craft and this emergence of brands that are just good, sourcing good juice and putting a blend and a unique experience to it. I mean, a hundred percent. I think, I, I think you've got, you, you knocked it on the head here with this. I might have to take you up on that offer and, and, and buy a set. No, you, uh, I'm coming up with something because I have a couple of retailers who wanted to come up with something where they can give some of their customers some. And so I'm coming up with something and I'm working on it now. And I'll be happy to talk to you about it. So the, yeah, let, let whoever's listening, get in touch with you. You can get it through, get it through the gentleman who had me on this podcast. <laughs> well, Definitely. to anyone listening, if you haven't tried it yet and you have the opportunity, um, you better just pull the trigger because you're not going to be disappointed. And, and frankly, <laughs> I, I don't think you're going to get that chance again. Cause from what I've been seeing, I've not seen anyone that, that's tried this. was like, Oh, it's not really for me. I don't, you know, everyone I know that's tried it was like, wow, where can I get a bottle? Can I get more than one? Can I get different blends? That have, I mean, everyone I know that's tried it wants more of it. Uh, I want more of it. You know, my bottle, I'm, I'm looking what we already drank on this podcast and I'm just not enough. I'm, I'm a no. little sad. I <laughs> know a hundred percent. I Luke poured this sample and sent it over and I'm just, I'm already halfway done with this thing. <laughs> the, the, no, this is, this is, thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate the, uh, I appreciate the kind words. Look, I have a philosophy and I think it was in part what um, drove uh, the success of my previous, you know, brand Whistlepig. The I like to deliver, um, and I've taken into an extreme. I think in this case, because, you know, what are you selling a bottle at right now? Of the Bakta Fifty, do you have it in yet? No, we don't have it in the store. Okay, so you're you're gonna we're launching in Florida, in uh, in a couple of weeks, and so that'll get remedied and you'll probably have it for sale somewhere. I'm going to guess in the high 300 range, maybe low 400, whatever it is, you know, looking at what you're buying here, that's a phenomenal steal. And I want to work with a couple of partners. So you're, you know, you've got your listeners and deliver this because prices will be going up on it. It's a 70 year product. I mean, what is a McAllen 25 right now? Three grand. Yeah. 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 2,500 somewhere around there. Three grand. You're getting something almost three times as old for yeah. 10%. Yeah, it's going to be heavily oaked. And <laughs> you know, it yeah. almost makes me feel like I got low self-esteem selling this stuff for like only $400. I mean, we got to get to fix that. Right. Oh, prices go up, man. It's spoken like a true. <laughs> but you yeah. have managed to put magic in a bottle and, and you have managed to find a, something that is so unique and so pleasant and, and, and exquisite at the same time. I, I am blown away by it. I was, I was touched by one of the things in the, uh, uh, the background we were reading where I think it was you that said uh, uh, master distilling is, uh, master blending is becoming as much of an art as master distilling or words to that effect. And, and I sure agree with it. And I'm sure amazed. We, we've had a few folks pass through here who have blended some really fine product. Mm -hmm. uh, and this one is just off the charts. And, and, and as Luke was saying, when you're drinking this and, and, and you reflect on everything that was going on in your opening soliloquy about what was going on in the world at that time, it's, just an experience that is not to be believed. And um, if it's sitting in Market Square Liquors or, or Alex, if it's sitting on the bar there at Market Square Liquors, yep. uh, this, this is a story to tell. That's what I was going to mention. So we, we've got a lounge where we've opened, you know, some of the most comprehensive collections of bourbons, whiskeys, and scotches probably found anywhere in America. And, I, and I, I look at everyone's menu across the country. So I'm quite confident in that statement. But I mean, for us, you know, it's it's like these other retailers doing stupid things like selling at secondary market prices. We absolutely don't believe in that. Right. You know, so when we did the lounge, 
you know, it's, we we're here to, instead of me selling one bottle to one person, I'd rather do it by the glass at a price that is probably so low. People are going to think that I'm crazy, but now I get to share that experience. Cause I mean, the cornerstone of our business is customer service and product knowledge. And I assure yeah. you, just like you have product knowledge for your SKUs, we have it for a lot of the SKUs. Yeah. So we'd rather, you know, we're, we're in the business of getting experiences out to people. Uh, and this is definitely something that will make the bar, uh, will make the, the shelf at our lounge hundred percent. Wonderful. We'll, we'll, we'll get you, I'll get you, um, I'll definitely come and visit and I'll talk to you about that, uh, that stockholder piece, because if you had a collection and I think of, uh, of each of the, uh, barrels that are coming out here, that would be, I think you would be the only one in the country actually. With that. <laughs> yeah. We might have to definitely do that to the store. Absolutely. Yeah. You can go ahead and count on that. Let's, let's figure out how to get it done. We'll do it. Okay. All right. That would be awesome. Man, I would love to go to the lounge and, and have a few flights of these oh, yeah. badges and just sit there and pick them all apart and just. And they're all, they're all names. So I've got them, so you got like barrel seven, right? And then that's called Guinevere. They're all named after these like knights. I was reading about this book of knights. Pretty cool characters. Um, and they range between. You know, this is looks like these are in the mid '90s. Proof wise, the the average age goes between you know mid '60s to mid '70s on them. They're, what'll blow you away is that they actually like in each barrel is unique. They're all exquisite, but they're each unique. So the we will follow up on that point, and hopefully some of your uh, some of your uh, good listeners and the other folks will get a chance to uh, to try it. Yeah, absolutely. The buck up fifty. So one one last question from me is when you your wife ran you out of the house and you you took a drive over there and uh, when you finally came back home, she asked what you'd been doing. Was it sort of nah, not much? I or? told her I was stuck in a bordello for a week. <laughs> the, the and that I had the credit card bill for a week. <laughs> the, <laughs> You were gone a week. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> she, she, she thought that was so over the top that she didn't believe me and it diffused the situation. <laughs> it was only half true. Well, on behalf of uh, many drinkers around the world, we tell her we, we really appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, if she didn't run me at the house, we might not be drinking this fine juice right now. <laughs> That's true. No, no, no. It's absolutely true. No, yeah. I mean... <laughs> That, that worked out really well for yeah. us, I got to say. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Our hat's off to your wife. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. She's a lovely woman. She's a lovely woman. I'm glad. No, look, a lot of things. I mean, here's the thing that I really get to. There are so many layers of chance, modern chance, right? The the I had to meet the guy who, I you know, I was talking with, with my, my head of operations, Giles, the other day. The, and I was trying to come up with some naming system. I, we've got this this Bakta 50. We're gonna it, we're gonna evolve the name into the Bakta Stockholder 50 because of what I was explaining on the stockholder program before, and that becomes like a real you know investment bottle. The because it's got all these old vintages anyway. I'm getting off the point. The point was being the layers of chance that are required for that bottle to land land into your hands. One, it had to be for sale, which it hadn't been in for 150 years. Two, I happened to, I had to have gotten chased out of my house. Three, I happened to have jumped in the car that day that I wasn't going to go jump out to, to taste the whiskey finish, because I think that that's what seals the deal on the, on the entire thing. Because I never would have thought, as you were saying, Luke, about the whiskey finish, you know, before I would have never gone for it. I mean, so many different layers of chance had to have happened. And Armagnac didn't uh, needed to have stayed a secret, right? I mean, what are the chances? I mean, you have everybody scouring the planet for all these different types of, you know, categories and stuff like that. I mean, this is basically a much higher end mezcal, right? Uh, instead of being made in Mexico is being made in France for centuries. That's been aged and it's just never been found. I mean, it's people have known it's there, but it hasn't reached the consumer. So Oh, and then which what all the stocks would have sold out. So I mean, it's layer after layer, and a bottle. And I'll put it this way: I'll, I'll end on this note. 
When you look back and as Bakta, you know, by the grace of God becomes uh, one of the, you know, iconic spirits brands uh, on the planet. Uh, and we look back at the time when a bottle of spirit blended a blend from 1868 to 1970 could have bought for $400. We'll all laugh and cry or laugh and cry, depending on, I guess, how much you've, you've got of it, but it's a truly unique opportunity. And what I'm trying to do is keep those prices, which in line is what you're talking about, Alex, your philosophy at the store, the keep the prices in such a way that it's an attainable, uh, you know, product. I know it's not, a, I know it's not a cheap thing. The, the, but the value that you're getting in something like this is there is nothing remotely close to it in the world of spirits. I'll say that again. There is nothing remotely close to it in terms of value in the world of spirits. And in terms of tastes, you know, you heard these guys, I'm not paying them to say anything. So the, the, it is, it's something, you know, out of this world. So uh, that's why I put my name on it, frankly. It wasn't because anybody woke up this morning and said, Raj, you know, that Bakta name, people are just dying to, you know, get something named Bakta. <laughs> I can honestly say, I, I mean, I've tried hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of whiskey, scotches, wines, maybe into the thousands. I mean, this is truly a unique, a unique product here. Well, done. thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just really, I mean, I don't even know what else to say about it. It's just, it is such an immersive experience from the look of it to the taste of it, to the history of, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's just really something special. And, and I'm grateful that we had the chance to not only to try it, but to, to sit down with you, Raj, and, and, and learn more and, and, and frankly, get a history lesson. Uh, <laughs> Cause that's what, again, that's what this is. I'll be down. I'll be down in. Uh, I've got a ranch in uh, Vero Beach, uh, and I'll be down there. My daughter's getting her uh, first communion around uh, then, so I'll I'll be down in Florida. Maybe I'll take a ride up and uh, and. Uh, oh, we'd love we'd and, love to host you uh, up there and, and show you some of our cool things that we've got going on and, and grab grab a meal. I, I definitely, if you can make it happen, come on out. All right, we'll make that happen. My, my laptop is telling me it's going to die. It's not a bullshit thing, and I'm not trying to get off the thing, but the thing is uh, giving me a signal. That, oh, not uh, at all. We know you're a busy guy. We know you're a busy guy. We appreciate you taking the time. No, it's not bullshit. It's telling me <laughs> your Mac will sleep soon unless plugged in, and I can't find my, my outlet, so I don't want to just vanish. If I do, I'm happy to go until it dies, but uh, I'm just letting you know that I could just go, and I'm gone. Thank you so much. Yeah, Raj, we can't thank you enough. We'll let you get back to all the important work you're doing. Um, but thank you for the spirit. Thank you for this this time to talk with you. And, and I wish we could talk with you all night about things you got in the works and things you've done in the past. But um, I'm just so glad of this. we had this experience and our listeners had this experience. We really can't thank you enough. Well, I'll see you. I'll see you there in person. And I'm glad I was able to share. And uh, I look forward to meeting uh, you all when I'm uh, up in your neck of the woods, which hopefully is sooner than later. I thank you for your time and thanks for having me on. All right. Cheers, Raj. Bye bye. Hey, everyone. Thanks again for tuning in to the Capital City Bourbon Show. We have more great episodes planned for you in the future, so come back and join us on the porch. Cheers, y'all.